What is up, nerds and nerdettes? Long time no see. So my bachelor's degree is in criminal justice. I've worked in security, I've worked in law enforcement, and I currently work in healthcare. I have no formal training in any form of editing or Photoshop or uh, performing. All the stuff for this show I've kind of learned secondhand or taught myself or just kind of watched YouTube videos about how to do it. I'm still learning and picking stuff up slowly as I go. So guess what new trick I learned this week? That's right, I learned how to use chroma key. This is so cool and fun. Look at all the cool stuff I can do. It's, uh, it's awesome, right? I can even make it rain euros, bitches. The one problem with using chroma key is it does leave you open to Shia LaBeouf infestations. But those are actually pretty easy to fix. Yeah, this shit's so much fun. Let's talk about comic books or whatever. All right, what's the first dumb book we're talking about this week? Let's see. I Hate Fairyland by Scooty Young. You may hate Fairyland, but I hate this book. I Hate Fairyland is a story about a little girl who gets sucked into this um, fairy tale dimension and needs to go on a magical adventure to get herself home. Unfortunately, that magical adventure to get home takes 27 years. During those 27 years, she never ages physically. The 27 years of constantly navigating fairy tale nonsense breaks the main character mentally. And she essentially turns into a thieving, murdering psychopath. Now, this book is beautiful and fun to look at. I've always loved the art of Scooty Young. The way he meshes this cute, vibrant fairy tale world with violent, over the top gore really creates a jarring and unique look. But unfortunately, uh, this isn't enough to save the book. I Hate Fairyland is very obviously trying to be a comedy. I mean, duh, scenes like this aren't meant to be a wellspring of dramatic tension. Unfortunately for a comedy book, this book just isn't funny, like, at all. It's pretty much just a regurgitation of the same joke over again. The little girl does something violent and gory and is supposed to swear, but instead of swearing, she puts in a cute word, like fudge or muffin or fucking hug or something like that. And this joke is repeated over and over again as a stand-in for actual humor. And I guess the book is supposed to derive a lot of comedy from the aforementioned violence mixing with cutie art style, but that's like a one panel joke. And by the end of the book, you're kind of tired of looking at it and, and tired of getting beat to death with what is essentially the tail end of a knock-knock joke. I guess I hate Fairyland's world is interesting and I don't hate spending time in it. So the book could still turn into something interesting and funny, but if you look at the actual substance of this first issue, uh, there's not a lot to go on. I love the spirit behind this book and I love what it's going for, but however, I do not love its execution. I have made numerous videos and written numerous articles about how great the current run of Batman is. If you want to watch or read a random one, go ahead and click on this protozoa. I'm not going to repeat myself about how the synergy between Snyder and Capullo is maybe the best in comic book history. I'm not going to talk about how disciplined the book's narrative is when it's looking at the grander scope of things. I'm not going to go on about how it redefined Batman for modern generation. I'm not going to do any of those things because they just did those things. What I am gonna talk about is how one of the most underrated aspects of this run has been how well it's just embraced the goofy, over-the-top, awesome aspect of what makes comic books great. To demonstrate this, there's a scene in this book where Robot Batman swings two sharks at bad guys, like he's frickin' Kratos. If you're not reading this series, your pull list has a huge, gaping, gory, Kali Ma-style hole in it. I don't care if you have to mortgage your house, sell your bone marrow, and or work for an off-world mining corporation in order to afford these books, but read them. This is one of the best series of our generation. Twilight Children takes place in a small, quiet coastal village. The book does a really great job of setting up this town, filling it with interesting and nuanced characters, and weaving in all these different subplots. By the time it's done, the town feels like a living, breathing, real place. What does not feel real is how all of a sudden these giant glowing balls of fusion and mystery just kind of show up out of nowhere and then disappear and how all of the people in this town seem to think that's the normal thing to have go on. It's really interesting how this book starts as like a normal kind of character drama book, and then all of a sudden drops a very big and very odd sci-fi element into its story. Everyone in the town seems completely nonplussed by this very odd occurrence. The book lets the mystery of what these fears are sort of hang over the narrative for most of the issue. But as the book closes, the mystery is bridged just ever so slightly. A little morsel of answers we are given makes this book the most exciting and interesting new series to launch this week. Spider-Gwen's back! Yay! It's still good to read it. Lewis and Clark might present the most interesting concept for a comic book that I've seen in a very long time. 
The plot of this book is the pre-New 52 Superman has found his way into the New 52 universe. Him, Lois, and his son are currently living very much under the radar. I guess that's kind of cool, but a book about a dude raising his child with his loving wife isn't exactly laden with opportunities for butthole-winking excitement. The really cool part of this book is the incognito Superman is using his knowledge of the pre-New 52 universe to stop villains and evil plots before they happen in the New 52 universe. He's doing all of this sort of under the radar. So the, so the Justice League and all the other heroes of the New 52 are completely unaware that he is behind the scenes, tweaking events and trying to build a better world. This setup leaves a lot of really cool places for the story to go. It leaves the door open to introduce a lot of characters that haven't seen a new life in the New 52. It also presents an almost endless amount of cool scenarios that could play out. Like what if the New 52 isn't fated to follow the same timeline as the pre-New 52 universe? What if Superman's interfering with things ultimately makes things worse? This issue is tightly written, the art is really solid, and the concept is strong as hell. The only thing I don't like about it is it makes a lot of references both visually and in some of the characters it introduces to the mullet era of Superman, which is pretty much and arguably the worst era of Superman. And I, and I would kind of prefer if the creative team wouldn't mind that for fuel for this new story. I would just kind of prefer if that entire era of Superman would just like die out from a case of aggressive, numerous, and jagged colon polyps. But regardless of all that nitpicky nonsense, this is probably my favorite new DC book and I highly recommend y'all check it out. So you guys know that I am bound by the constitution to talk about sex criminals every time a new issue of sex criminals comes out. Trust me, it's in there, near the back. Yes, sex criminals is funny and goofy and constantly shocking and surprising panel to panel. But what elevates it from simply being a funny, goofy book to being a legendary book is that it is just so smart in the way it dissects human sexuality. Each issue sort of tackles a little different piece of us, either how we develop as a person or as a sexual being or how different uh, forms of sexuality uh, form us and who we end up becoming. This issue is kind of based around the idea of asexuality, uh, the idea that a person would just have no interest in sex and kind of gather no satisfaction from it. It follows the life of a brand new character as she struggles to understand uh, the role sex will play in her life when she has absolutely no interest in it. It really captures the feeling of being an outcast, of feeling like you don't belong with other people. When it gets to its point, it does an incredible job of separating sex from satisfaction and arousal. It shows us that human beings are able to, to achieve a higher level of existence, a higher level of pleasure from things other than, you know, sticking their genitals into things. But it wouldn't be sex criminals if it didn't make these points in incredibly weird, gross, and hilarious ways. This is a book that makes a profound point about human sexuality while casting Carl Sagan as some sort of sexual Jiminy Cricket. I would refuse to go on and on again about how great this series is. Just know that um, this is not only a great piece of comic bookage or a great piece of literature, this is one of those things that you read it and it changes you. It changes the way you see yourself, it changes the way you see other people, it, it is um, enlightening. And it's, a, and it's a piece of artwork that can actually have um, an effect on your life and who you are and who you will become. So. It's, I feel it's important to acknowledge those kind of things when they come out. So you really need to experience sex criminals. Move it to the top of your to-read pile, put it in your pull list, just get it inside your brain. Please, if you listen to one thing I've ever said in this show, which I do not recommend for the most part, but this one you need to listen to. Read Sex Criminals. It's, it's going to affect you. Well, the show's own personal egg timer has run out. I'll go ahead and power through this outro so I don't waste your time. Hopefully I said something here that sparked something inside your brain and made you want to discuss things. The good thing is YouTube builds in a tool for you to discuss things in the comments below. So go ahead and warm up your keyboard and I'll meet you down there. We've hit 300 subscribers, which is insignificant, but it seems like a giant uh, number to me. And I thank you all uh, so much for getting us there. I'm very flattered and I'm having a hell of a time and I really enjoy this time we spend together every week even though we're not actually together. I'm in Chicago and you are hopefully uh, not in Chicago. Uh, anywho, uh, back on task. Make sure you're following the channel both on Twitter and Facebook. If you like what you see here, make sure you don't only subscribe to this channel but also to our sister channel, VGTM Games. It's basically just me and Cody again, but this time we're playing games. Like literally everyone else on YouTube. For every new subscriber get this week, I'll put in one extraneous chroma key based joke. Like for example, this one. 
Make sure you come back next Sunday and every Sunday to the time for the episode of the poll. Now get out of here and go read Sex Criminals. Captain America suffers from a unique problem in that he does not get to define his own symbol. His chest is not dressed in a non-contextual character such as a crimson S, a flying mammal, or an arachnid.